Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Akoski of Funny back at it once again. Kicking in for you and for yours. And I want to give a shout to my ancestors, you know what I'm saying, for making this possible. And I also want to give a shout to y'all, you know what I'm saying, the watcher and the subscriber. Now, this right here, this shit is long overdue, and it should have been done a long time ago. This is about Robert F. Williams, you know what I'm saying? And many people don't know much about Robert F. Williams, it's a shame. I didn't learn about him until later on in my life. You know, he's not really put up there in the pantheon like he should be of the 60s civil rights struggle. Meet the fierce civil rights leader who first urged armed resistance to racial oppression in the 1950s. He was a decade or more ahead of the Black Panthers and other blacks who rejected the principle of nonviolence spearheaded by the mainstream civil rights movement. Robert F. Williams was the first African-American civil rights leader to advocate armed resistance to racial oppression and violence, often violent to meet violence with violence and civil rights struggle. Despite the inspiring movement of black power in the late 60s, helping, and helping motivate groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM, he was criticized by some individuals within the civil rights struggle due to his militant and relative stance. Born in Monroe County, North Carolina in 1925, Wayne was the grandson of former slaves. During World War II, he migrated to Detroit, Michigan, where he worked in the auto factory and organized for the United Auto Workers, the UAW. Growing up, Wayne was learned to adjust quickly to danger of being black in the Deep South, especially as the white white supremacist group, the Ku Klux Klan, was wreaking havoc against black people in most communities. Wayne's grandmother, before she died, gave him what would be his first rifle, a gun that belonged to the family to serve as a city a symbol of the family resistance against racial oppression, a report said by PBS. Williams would fight in a race riot in Detroit in 1943 and have a stint in the Marines before returning to Monroe in 1955. In 1956, Williams was elected president of the local chapter of the, N of the National Association of Advancement of Colored People the NAACP. At the time, the local branch of the association was near collapse as had to deal with the fierce criticism from the KKK. But Williams eventually brought a new membership and increased the membership from just six to 200 members. According to the black past, Williams built a membership of his own image, working class, militant, and armed, a far cry from the moderate middle class maker of the national organization. He fought for a charter from the National Rifle Association and formed the Black Guard, an armed group that was physically trained and gave weapons to protect the black population in Monroe. Williams spearheaded the local civil rights campaign and highlighted the conditions of Jim Crow in the South in both national and international media. He further led the fight to desegregate local public swimming pool amidst the strong opposition from local whites in the KKK. The radical civil rights leader would, in 1959, help gain support for gubernatorial pardons for two young African-American boys who were jailed for kissing a white girl in what is known as the kissing case of 1958. During that period, a Jerry Monroe had acquitted a white man of attempted rape of a black woman. This anger was forcing him to make what's been described as a historic statement that would ruin his membership with the NAACP. If the law if the United States Constitution cannot be enforced in this social jungle called Dixie, it's time that Negroes must defend themselves, either than means is necessary to resort to violence. That there is no law there, here, there, that is needed no need to take white attackers to court because they will go free. And the federal government who is not coming to the act of aid of the people who are oppressed. And it is time for the Negro man to stand up and be man. And it is necessary for us to die, we must be willing to die. It is necessary for us to kill, we must be willing to kill. The NAACP, which felt Williams decided violence with those words, suspended him. And in 1961, the Freedom Riders, an interracial group of activists, stormed and wrote to protest against the passive resistance, which had almost become the trademark of the mainstream civil rights movement. In the heat of the demonstration, the writers were attacked by Klansmen, 
and this forced her to seek help from Williams in his black car. Williams would shelter a white couple from an African American mob amidst the protest. But this would rather cause him to flee Monroe alongside his family after he was accused of kidnapping the couple. Williams and his family took up residence in Cuba as guests of Fidel Castro. For the next five years in Cuba, Williams went ahead to fight for human rights for black people through his daily news, through his newsletter, The Crusader, as well as a weekend radio program, Radio Free Dizzy, that reached thousands of black listeners in the U.S. In 1962, he wrote a book, Negro with Guns, which would be the single most important intellectual influence on Huey P. Newton, the founder of the Black Panther Party. Williams and his family moved to China in 1966, where he became friends and advisors to Mao Zedong and other influential personalities. He would, for the next few years, travel throughout Africa and Asia, speaking out against racism and colonialism. In 1968, while in Tanzania, he was named the first president of the Black Nationalist Organization in the Republic of New Africa. In 1969, Williams returned to the U.S., and all charges against him were dropped. He severed himself from the Black Power Movement, probably due to changes in his political disposition and having been advising the State Department on his relations with China. Before his death in 1996 of Hodgkin lymphoma, Wayne was an active in the People's Association for Human Rights in Baldwin and lectured about the civil rights in schools and churches. At his funeral, activist Rosa Parks praised him for the, his courage and commitment to the freedom. She said the sacrifices he made and what he did should go down in history and never be forgotten. And there you have it. That's about our ancestor and a wonderful civil rights, you know, icon that's not talked about, Robert F. Williams. I advise people to get read the book Nigger with Guns. It's very enlightening. It's very eye-opening. Uh, it's a great read. You know what I'm saying? It's under 100 pages. It's a great read, you know what I'm saying, about what the man and what he did and what he went through and how he built stuff up. This one doesn't also talk about, they don't go in depth about the debate he had with the NAACP about the nonviolent issue and the debate he had with Martin Luther King, a debate which he won against Martin Luther King. And maybe we don't talk about that, and, you know, during this, you know what I'm saying. So there's a lot of things about this man's life that's not being discussed, you know, that should be discussed. And hopefully this can open some doors and drop some seeds to some people to read more and find out more about this this great, great ancestor. Dr. Malcolm X and you know he's friends with Malcolm X and he was friends with Martin Luther King. You know what I'm saying? Even they don't scotch that either. You know, he knew both of the guys. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, y'all have a good day. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button. Black history dropping every day, all day. Peace.